down with dope, up with hope, register to vote. Ooh. That's how I start everything out there. All right. <laughs> We're here at Georgia Fireline, and today we have an opportunity to talk to Tig Davis. So, Tig, you are a huge Second Amendment influencer online. Mm. And this is kind of a bittersweet moment for me, just because of the fact that um, you're going to be taking on a new career, which you'll talk about, and you're stepping aside a little bit from firearms for a moment. And But the sweet part of this is that I had the opportunity to work with you, um, watch you, learn from you as an instructor. So best of luck to you. But again, it's going to really, you know, I know a lot of people will be sad that you're going to be leaving the area for right now. So before I get too far down the line with some questions, tell us a little bit about your background. I know you started early, well, not early with firearms, but you have a military background. So tell us a little bit about how you got involved with firearms. Yeah, so I was in the military for seven years. I joined at 17, fresh out of high school. Okay. Uh, at that time, I had absolutely no firearm experience, you know, at 17 right. years old. But, you know, I learned how to shoot in the yep. military. I deployed overseas. Uh, okay. I can still carry a handgun as a part of my deployment. I was a military intelligence collector which sounds way cooler than it is. Right. I promise it's not that awesome. Okay. Um, and then I came home and I just needed something to do. And okay. something that was familiar to me was firearms, firearms because I had been carrying and, and learning and using the firearms. Um, so I got out, got into uh, teaching at a gun, gun range, a local gun range. And it was a good response for me having the women come up and gotcha. specifically say, hey, this is the first time I've ever seen a woman here as an instructor right. yeah. and carrying and you can shoot, shoot and, you know, you look like me and, <laughs> you know, we have things in common. And they were specifically asked for me to teach them. Okay. And I did that for about a year until I decided, okay, I think maybe it's time for me to go at it on sure. my own, sure. you know, do this full time. So that's when I started my firearm instruction company in November 2016. And I've been training women across the country since, since then. Since then. And mm -hmm. that company is My Sister's Keeper's Defense. Yes. So a very popular company. And you can still find some of that merchandise and some of the things. You've done some books yes. that you've written. Uh, I've seen you on a number of television programs uh, across the nation when you get something happens and people want to talk about firearms, mm -hmm. you get that phone call to come in and represent uh, your point of view on the firearms. And for the audience, um, we get this so sometimes, and Tig is not my daughter, believe it or <laughs> not, right? I do have two daughters, and right. Tig's not one of them, but definitely um, we get that question uh, a lot of times when we're working together, definitely. like, that's your daughter over there? And I'm like, um, nope, that's not my daughter. Right, you're like my bonus dad. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know if they're saying, well, man, you're old. I guess, well, yeah, I am old enough to probably be your uh, a parent. I think you're about yours. the same age as my dad. Same close. age as your dad, yeah. close. Okay, <laughs> but just officially, just want people to know. So let's talk a little bit about the rise um, of ownership among African-American women. Mm -hmm. They are, that group, is leading sales in terms of purchasing firearm over the past two and a half, three years. Right. What do you think is pushing that, pushing African-American women to become more uh, firearm owners? I think it's a couple of things. One, I think gun ownership as a whole has become more normalized. Okay. It used to be such a taboo topic. Right. And then you go back into the history of gun ownership, especially yeah. for African-Americans and the yeah. Mulford Act. And, mm. you know, the, the, the initial reason why there yeah. was such a taboo, you know, it was a taboo topic in black communities was because it was literally illegal for African-Americans sure. to own firearms yeah. for many years in this country. Mm -hmm. So I started seeing around 2014, 15, where I was starting to see more African-American men and women shooting and going into the range and posting yeah. firearms. And then I think in 2020, the pandemic Demi happened. happened. Okay. Yeah, and then everybody was, you know, afraid. They were mm. afraid of, you know, what could happen with, you know, law enforcement officers not responding to as many calls because of the COVID you right. know, virus. Mm -hmm. And people felt like they needed to protect themselves. Okay. And I think that was the big push where we saw such a, a huge growth in gun ownership for African-American people. Wow. I mean, you're exactly right because we saw a lot of the numbers just went up. Mm -hmm. dr drastically in terms of people coming in wanting firearms, but you could see the surge of African-American women who pretty much wanted to purchase a firearm. So I'm not a, when person asks me, my personal belief is that there's no gender-based firearm. Mm -hmm. I know you have that same belief when it comes to a person choosing a firearm. Mm -hmm. How do you go about working with your clientele when you get ready to choose a firearm for that particular person? 
So for me, I tell my students that one, every person is different. Yeah. So what I like and what I carry and what my favorite firearms are may not work for them. Right. So I try to, I know as an influencer, mm -hmm. you know, everyone wants to know, hey, what do you shoot? I'm just gonna buy that. I'm like, okay. no, don't do that, right? Okay. We're different people. Yeah. So I try to get my students to actually narrow down their preferences mm -hmm. based off of their needs. Okay. So we do that by having a conversation in the classroom. Hey, is this gonna, gonna be for concealed carry? dedicated for home defense or both, right? Do you have a preference on having external safety or right. do you know what that is, right? Mm. Um, do you have any brand preferences and have you done any research and looked at any reviews for brands? And then what's your budget? Okay. So those four questions usually narrows it down to at least three or four firearms that I'd like for them to try that okay. fit within that criteria and then they go shoot and then we identify okay which one are you most accurate and most comfortable with okay because you can like a firearm in your hand at the gun counter right, right. and then you go shoot it yeah. and then you just doesn't work. it yeah. doesn't work that well mm -hmm. for you and I try to explain the subtle nuances between the different firearms okay. like hey do you like these type of sights versus this do you okay. like this grip angle you know or this trigger versus this one right. so they can kind of feel those differences, differences and, and you know figure out which one works for them so I see like when I talk to new buyers or shooters, I say, well, look, a semi-automatic has somewhat of a learning curve to mm -hmm. it. So if you're not going to take this serious, you know, you, you may want to talk about looking at a revolver mm -hmm. because it doesn't have much of a learning curve as a semi-automatic. But if you're going to practice, semi-automatic is something you definitely need to entertain. Mm -hmm. Now the safety thing comes up, which you mentioned. I'm not a huge external safety Me person either. on firearm, neither are you, okay. but I do see a lot of women come in and the first thing they want to look at on the firearm is does it have a safety, mm -hmm. okay? How do you maneuver or navigate around that question? So first, I let them know that most firearms they come into contact with don't have a safety, Correct. right? So I put that out the bat. So if you're looking for a firearm with the thumb safety, that's going to kind of narrow down your choices. Yeah. But then also I explain to them the difference. So a lot of people come in wanting to have a thumb safety because they feel like it's going to make them safer. Okay. When in all actuality, following the safety rules is what makes exactly. you safer. So right. I explain that to them, hey, you are what makes this gun safe, mm -hmm. not that switch on the side of it. Mm -hmm. You can think your firearm is on safe and then break the safety rules and hurt yourself hurt or someone else. And that's happened before, right? We've seen that on the news. So I explain to them thoroughly the safety rules, the fundamentals, right. and I have them practice indexing their trigger finger, right? muzzle discipline and by the end of that conversation out of probably 200 of the firearm selection classes that I've taught maybe only one person still was adamant about having that that external that safety, safety. Mm -hmm. okay. everyone else was like oh you're right if I follow the safety rules nothing then bad okay. can happen right great point yeah when choosing a gun range which you've traveled around the country you've been in multiple gun ranges people have different experiences when they go into a gun range mm -hmm. it can be intimidating based on hey, if I've never been inside that gun range. Right. When you're working with your clientele and your students, we see back here that the people who are working behind the counter for the most part are very good people, right? right. So how do you talk to cu customers or your clients about when they visit the gun range and what to expect? Mm -hmm. So first I tell them to do their research. Yeah. Go ahead and contact that range ahead of time, either mm. via phone or go to their website and find out exactly what you need to go there. So there are some ranges I've been to across the country where you had to be an NRA member to mm. even go to this range. Okay. There are some ranges that require you to schedule a class. If you're a new shooter, you have mm -hmm. to schedule, make an appointment for a firearm safety class before they allow you to shoot there. Okay. Um, so different ranges have different requirements. I always tell them, find out what requirements there are for you to shoot there find out the pricing, and find out if you're able to get the things you need to shoot at the range. Okay. Most ranges have rentals, most ranges have targets, ear and eye protection, but some don't. Some don't have rentals right. or the additional things you need to shoot, so they need to know that ahead of time. Okay. Yeah, I think rental is important because that gives you an opportunity to actually try the firearm right. before you purchase it. Uh, here at Georgia Fireline, we have an array of different firearms that people great can selection. try. Great selection. Mm -hmm. So that would be one reason that you would come here. Absolutely. Because you could use the rental along with your membership. So I think it's important for people, like you said, to do research in order to find out where they want their home range to be and what they, what they offer. When it comes to classes, you do a number of classes. You kind of start off with a basic pistol 101 class yes. like, like a lot of people do. But the last two and a half, three years, people are looking to go into self-defense, right? Mm -hmm. So they're purchasing this firearm either to carry with them or to have at home. Now, when it comes to carrying a firearm, 
it's a little bit more challenging for women because yes. the wardrobe changes, right? right? So how do you talk to people about or talk to women clients on what firearm they should have or look at when it comes to carry? So a couple of things. Every person's body is different. Yeah. And for women, you know, we come in all different shapes, sure, all same different sizes. Right, right. men solid, too, yeah. you know. Our yeah. bodies are shaped differently. So one, I manage expectations. Right. I have a lot of videos of me drawing from dresses and, and, okay. and skirts and, you know, different types of attire, crop tops. And I tell them, you know, you can conceal carry, you can learn, but you have to configure it to your body and how I conceal carry mm -hmm. may not work, work for, for you, you okay. right? I always try to manage expectations first. Okay. And then I let them know, one, you have to master the fundamentals, understand how to shoot and be safe. And then we can start thinking about carrying that firearm on your person. I make sure to specify that we are talking about on-person carry and mm -hmm. not off-body carry. I'm not a huge fan of bags, conceal carry okay. bags. For women especially, because if you are going to be targeted for theft, someone's probably just going to take the entire bag, sure. right? And then yep. now they have your firearm, firearm your keys, everything. your wallet. They have everything, yeah. mm -hmm. right? So I teach them how to get comfortable with carrying the firearm on their person. And I talk about the quality tools and accessories you need to do that. Okay. So like an inside the waistband holster that's made of Kydex. Mm -hmm. um, we also have Concealment Apparel. Dean Adams is a great company that makes concealment apparel for women. Okay. So they have yoga pants and shorts and they have corsets tops and it's effective and it's safe. I've tried out their products. Um, there's also Comfort Concealment. That's another company that makes concealment apparel for women. So I talk to them and, and introduce them to these organizations and companies where they can get what they need to carry safely and okay. effectively. Okay, good. Traditionally, when firearms, you look at the firearm being sold, we talk a little bit about uh, iron sights, right? Mm -hmm. Because normally 99.9% .9 of firearms now have an iron sight of some type on there, right? right. And what we're talking about, just kind of the iron sights uh, here and there. But now red dots have become very popular, okay? Right. And I'm a red dot guy now. I wasn't before, but Same. You know, red <laughs> dot, I, I'm a red dot on everything. When you're talking to a new person purchasing a firearm, mm -hmm. how often do you talk about having a red dot on a gun or does it make a difference for you for a new shooter? For me, for most of my students, since they're brand new, I may mention that it's an option that they yeah. can add later, but I always tell them you need to master shooting your iron sights before okay. you think of adding any Anything type of on optic okay. onto your firearm. Optics are great. You know, I love optics. I think they make, for me, they make it easier for me to shoot. I'm faster when I'm running a dot. You know, mm -hmm. I love them. I think okay. they're great. But at the end of the day, it's another thing that can fail. It has a failure point. Sure. And your iron sights are fixed, you know, outside of, you know, a crazy incident where you can knock your sights off. Right. Um, they're going to be there, right? Okay. you got to trust your sights. So I teach them you have to master being accurate and effective with your iron sights. Once you've mastered that, then consider adding an, an optic to your firearm. Good. Um, when we talk about the safety, um, when you look at some of the things that you've done on your social media, mm -hmm. right? And you do some things on safety. Matter of fact, you had me go viral. Yeah. Right? That's the first time I'd ever heard <laughs> of that, right? So um, we did a video, I think it was how to purchase a gun, yes. right? And I got, got all like these a million views. Million views mm -hmm. and people calling me going, hey, is that you? And I'm getting calls from all over the country. Right. Like, yeah, I'm still around. <laughs> but <laughs> when you talk about social media, how, how has that impacted your business? Social media has been great for my business. Mm -hmm. I have gotten so many interview requests and magazine articles printed just from seeing an image of me on social media. Okay. Um, I'll tell you, in 2016, I Googled a uh, black woman plus gun. Okay. Right. I Googled it just out of curiosity to see what's sure, up there. Huh? And I only saw models and people who were holding firearms improperly, breaking safety rules. Mm. It was just a bunch of like hot garbage. Okay. Right. <laughs> and now I Google black woman with gun or uh, women gun owner, women firearm instructor, and I see a lot of images of myself okay. and other women instructors who are properly handling firearms, talking about firearms from an educated perspective. Mm. And I think that has changed the narrative and it's bled over to social media as well. Okay. So social media has been a great tool. I think that when utilized properly, uh, we can spread this message of being a responsible gun owner. Unfortunately, with social media, you have some of the bad stuff too. Sure. You know, you yeah. have both. Yeah. But I think what's what's overpowering what I've seen in the 2A community is a great usage of social media with videos and tutorials and pictorials. I think it's awesome. Okay, fantastic. Now I want to get back to um, um, the part about I want to touch on is domestic violence, mm -hmm. okay? which is a very serious issue. Definitely. 
So according to Black Women Health Project, it said that domestic violence is the number one health issue among mm -hmm. African American women, right? And 40% of black women will, will pretty much experience domestic violence compared to 30% of their counterpart, mm -hmm. right? So it just kind of goes in the sense that people want to defend themselves, they want to be safe, right. but Domestic violence, I know you have some experience in mm -hmm. talking about domestic violence, so if you would share with us just what your intake is on domestic violence is. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm a survivor myself of domestic mm -hmm. violence. You know, I had a violent relationship before I was a firearm instructor. You know, thankfully I'm here to tell sure. the tale. Yeah. But I took that experience and I try to share with other women how you can get out of a violent mm -hmm. relationship and then also how to stay safe. Now, there are statistics that show that women who have a gun in the home are more likely to have that firearm used against them. Right. So it's actually like a negative impact. Mm -hmm. But what those numbers don't account for is, was that woman trained on using that firearm? Okay. Did she even know how to use, use it, firearm, right? And right. was she comfortable using that firearm? Mm -hmm. Because I feel like that would skew the numbers a little bit. Um, but I tell people who are in violent relationships or uh, any type of um, uneasy situation that a firearm is not an instant cure for okay. whatever you're going through and it may not resolve the issue. Mm -hmm. Having that firearm may escalate things. Sure. So we need to consider all options. We need to figure out how can you remove yourself from that environment altogether mm -hmm. where you don't even need to use a weapon. Okay. And then also thinking bigger, if you do decide to purchase a firearm, in addition to that, you need to take the classes and you also need to seek therapy. Get your mm. mental, emotional, and spiritual um, perspectives in a good in a okay. good situation, so that you can, you know, use the firearm in, in the way that it's designed to be used and when it's appropriate. Okay. Um, I don't want my students coming and acting off of emotion. Mm. Um, and I've actually had some students come and say, "Hey, I'm in a violent situation. I want to buy a gun today. Wow. Right? This is really bad for me." And I kind of talk to them and, and bring them to the realization that maybe there's another option for you, mm -hmm. right? If we can avoid this altogether, let's just do that and, okay. and kind of talk them down out of making such a rash decision. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you spoke on that. It, it's a subject that needs to be talked about more often. And the numbers, like I said, they're just so wide, the right. huge gap between that. Um, when you start to look at domestic violence, you know, um, when we look at these organizations out there, NRA, mm -hmm. right? Uh, there's another organization, NAGA, which mm -hmm. is more of an African American type of association. Do you talk to your students anything about those different groups or different associations that they should join or what the benefits or no benefits to it at all? Not really. I, I'm, I don't talk to my students about any organizations just because I'm not a member okay. of any gun organization outside of the USCCA, sure. of course. Uh, but yeah, I, I like to have my students make their own decisions because once we start getting into organizations that have politics. political, yeah, exactly, yeah. political affiliations, right. I don't want to influence anyone on politics. Yeah. Right. As an instructor, I try to stay completely away from it, mm -hmm. even though that's pretty difficult, right? Yep. But in my classes, when I speak about the laws and I speak about what you should and should not do, I'm speaking from a perspective of fact mm -hmm. and not opinion. Okay. Um, so I want them to not leave, you know, having any of my biases on them, right. I want them to make their own decisions and, and figure out if there's another good space for them. Okay, and I agree with you. I do the same thing in terms of these are the organizations. You make the choice, do your own research, mm -hmm. and I don't tell a person if I'm a member or, or not. Right. I think it's more of a political uh, decision for that, even though now you did touch on USCCA, but there are other people out there like the U.S. Law and Shield. Mm -hmm. This is more of the self-defense insurance or what I call the right. civil insurance, exactly. right? Um, being a member of USCCA, how has that impacted your business? It's been amazing. The USCCA is uh, like family to me. Okay. I actually lived up in West Bend, Wisconsin at the beginning of the pandemic while I was working at the USCCA headquarters. Okay. Um, and it's been great. I've learned a lot from Tim Schmidt. He is the CEO. He is an amazing, smart man. He, okay. he orchestrated this whole uh, membership-based program based off of a magazine. So okay. the USCCA started with just the Concealed Carry magazine 20 years ago. Wow. And and he actually wrote most of the articles himself under mm -hmm. pseudonyms. So you okay. thought there were other contributors. And then it grew and people were like, hey, well, we want to know about training. We actually want to take classes. Yeah. So then the USCCA had the instructor side. And yeah. then, you know, there was the liability insurance. Like, hey, if I use my firearm in a legal act of self-defense, mm. what's going to happen 
after that. So he was like, okay, well, let's get these people covered under a liability insurance. If they do use their firearm, we'll protect them on the criminal and civil side. Gotcha. And it's grown so far from yeah, there. And, you know, it's just an amazing organization because it offers a non-political option for people to get education, get important. training, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and, and to get the insurance that you need to be a responsible yeah. gun owner. And as you said, we, we, we're not advocating one or the other. Right. It's just a situation where... Uh, you have U.S. Law and Shield, you mm -hmm. have uh, U.S. CCA, and there's a few others out there as well. Uh, but you do, do your own research, find out right. which one you want to uh, be part of, if you want to be part of any of them. I think one thing U.S. CCA does us, for us as instructors, it helps us in terms of material and content that right. they have that you can lean on uh, with their videos and kind of introduced to your students as well. And I've created some of those videos. Yeah, you are. Yeah, yep, I'm, yep. I'm on the USCCA yep. website and the YouTube yep. commercials. People are always like, hey, I saw you yep. on the internet. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, that was me. You know, yep. we filmed that in 2020. But, you know, I, I like to tell people there are different avenues to getting education. Everyone can't afford to come to an in-person class. So with the USCCA's Protector Academy, there's you know, like 400 hours of video content of right. how to you know build a rifle, how to sight in your optic, how to conceal a carry, how to sure. draw from a holster, how to yeah. clean your firearm. There's so, so much content. Yeah. That, yeah, And I think that's important for people to have access to. Okay, great. Well, Tig, it has been a pleasure. I mean, I, I, I hate to say goodbye because I, I think you're gonna come back, you're gonna visit, Definitely. you're gonna be around. Uh, so this isn't a final goodbye, but is there anything you'd like to share with us before you head off into your next venture? i just like to say it's been an honor. It's been a pleasure working with you guys. Georgia Firing Line is family. You mm -hmm. guys will forever be my, my, my friends, and I'm definitely going to come back to visit and work with you guys. Um, I just appreciate the opportunity. EJ, you were the person who got me to work here okay. a year ago, <laughs> yep. you know, almost a year and a half ago, right. and yep. it's just been amazing and a blessing for my business to be able to work with Georgia Firing Line. So I just want to say thank you. Tig, we thank you. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate everything you've done with us and for us. So I'm just looking to your next venture that you go into to support you and wish you the best of luck. And when we get together again, we'll go on the range and we'll do some shooting. Definitely. Appreciate it, Tig. Thank you. Thank you. Bang. Ba-doom. Whoo. <laughs> <laughs>